Chapter 11 of All Roads Lead to Calvary. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. All Roads Lead to Calvary by Jerome K. Jerome. Chapter 11. In the spring, Joan, at Mrs. Denton's request, undertook a mission. It was to go to Paris. Mrs. Denton had meant to go herself, but was laid up with sciatica, and the matter she considered would not brook of any delay. It's rather a delicate business, she told Joan. She was lying on a couch in her great library, and Joan was seated by her side. I want someone who can go into private houses and mix with educated people on their own level, and especially I want you to see one or two women they count in France. You know French pretty well, don't you? Oh, sufficiently, Joan answered. The one thing her mother had done for her had been to talk French with her when she was a child. And at Girton, she had chummed on with a French girl and made herself tolerably perfect. You will not go as a journalist, continued Mrs. Denton, but as a personal friend of mine, whose discretion I shall vouch for. I want you to find out what the people I am sending you among are thinking themselves and what they consider ought to be done. If we are not very careful on both sides, we shall have the newspapers whipping us into war. The perpetual Egyptian trouble had cropped up again, and the Carlton papers in particular were already sounding the toxin. Carlton's argument was that we ought to fall upon France and crush her, before she could develop her supposed submarine menace. His flaming posters were at every corner. Every obscure French newspaper was being ransacked for insults and pinpricks. A section of the Paris press is doing all it can to help him, of course, explained Mrs. Denton. It doesn't seem to matter to them that Germany is only waiting her opportunity, and that, if Russia comes in, it is bound to bring Austria... Europe will pay dearly one day for the luxury of a free press. But you're surely not suggesting any other kind of press at this period of the world's history, exclaimed Joan. Oh, but I am, answered the old lady, with a grim tightening of the lips. Not even Carlton would be allowed to incite to murder or arson. I would have him prosecuted for inciting a nation to war. Why is the press always so eager for war, mused Joan? According to their own account, war doesn't pay them. I don't suppose it does, not directly, answered Mrs. Denton, but it helps them to establish their position and get a tighter hold upon the public. War does pay the newspaper in the long run. The daily newspaper lives on commotion, crime, lawlessness in general. If people no longer enjoyed reading about violence and bloodshed, half their occupation, and that the most profitable half would be gone. It is the interest of the newspapers to keep alive the savage in human nature, and war affords the readiest means of doing this. You can't do much to increase the number of gruesome murders and loathsome assaults beyond giving all possible advertisement to them when they do occur. But you can preach war and cover yourself with glory as a patriot At the same time, I wonder how many of my ideals will be left to me, sighed Joan. I always used to regard the press as the modern pulpit. The old puppet became an evil the moment it obtained unlimited power, answered Mrs. Denton. It originated persecution and inflamed men's passions against one another. It, too, preached war for its own ends, taught superstition and punished thought as a crime. The press of today is stepping into the shoes of the medieval priest. It aims at establishing the worst kind of tyranny, the tyranny over men's minds. They pretend to fight among themselves, but it's rapidly becoming a close corporation. The Institute of Journalists will soon be followed by the Union of Newspaper Proprietors, and the few independent journals will be squeezed out. Already we have German shareholders on English papers, and English capital is interested in the St. Petersburg press. It will one day have its international pope, 
and its school of cosmopolitan cardinals. Joan laughed. I can see Carlton rather fancying himself in a tiara, she said. I must tell Phillips what you say. He's out for a fight with him. Government by parliament or government by press is going to be his war cry. Good man, said Mrs. Denton. I'm quite serious. You tell him from me that the next revolution has got to be against the press and it will be the stiffest fight democracy has ever had. The old lady had tired herself. Joan undertook the mission. She thought she would rather enjoy it and Mrs. Denton promised to let her have full instructions. She would write to her friends in Paris and prepare them for Joan's coming. Joan remembered folk the artist she had met at Flossie's party, who had promised to walk with her on the terrace at St. Germain and tell him more about her mother. She looked up his address on her return home and wrote to him, giving him the name of the hotel in the Rue de Grenelle, where Mrs. Denton had arranged that she should stay. She found a note from him awaiting her when she arrived there. He thought she would like to be quiet after her journey. He would call round in the morning. He had presumed on the privilege of age to send her some lilies. They had been her mother's favorite flower. Monsieur Folk, the great artist, had brought them himself and placed them in her dressing room. So Madame informed her. It was one of the half dozen old hotels still left in Paris and was built around a garden famous for its mighty mulberry tree. She breakfasted underneath it and was reading there when Folk appeared before her, smiling and with his hat in his hand. He excused himself for intruding upon her so soon, thinking from what she had written him that her first morning might be his only chance. He evidently considered her remembrance of him a feather in his cap. We old fellows feel a little sadly at times how unimportant we are, he explained. We are grateful when youth throws us a smile. You told me my coming would take you back 33 years, Joan reminded him. It makes us about the same age. I shall treat you as just a young man. He laughed. Don't be surprised, he said, if I make a mistake occasionally and call you Lena. Joan had no appointment till the afternoon. They drove out to St. Germain and had déjeuner at a small restaurant opposite the chateau. And afterwards they strolled onto the terrace. What was my mother doing in Paris, asked Joan. She was studying for the stage, he answered. Paris was the only school in those days. I was at Julian's studio. We acted together for some charity. I had always been fond of it. An American manager who was present offered us both an engagement, and I thought it would be a change and that I could combine the two arts. And it was here that you proposed to her, said Joan. Just by that tree that leans forward, he answered, pointing with his cane a little way ahead. I thought that in America I'd get another chance. I might have, if your father hadn't come along. I wonder if he remembers me. Did you ever see her again after her marriage, asked Joan? No, he answered. We used to write to one another until she gave it up. She had got into the habit of looking upon me as a harmless sort of thing to confide in and ask advice of, which he never took. Forgive me, he said. You must remember that I am still her lover. They had reached the tree that leant a little forward before its fellows, and he had halted and turned so that he was facing her. Did she and your father get on together? Was she happy? I don't think she was happy, answered Joan. She was at first. As a child, I can remember her singing and laughing about the house and she liked always to have people about her, until her illness came. It changed her very much, but my father was gentleness itself to the end. They had resumed this stroll. It seemed to her that he looked at her once or twice a little oddly, without speaking. What caused your mother's illness, he asked abruptly. The question troubled her. It struck her with a pang of self-reproach that she had always been indifferent to her mother's illness, regarding it as more or less imaginary. It was mental rather than physical, I think, she answered. I never knew what brought it about. Again he looked at her with that odd, inquisitive expression. 
She never got over it, he asked. Oh, there were times, answered Joan, when she was more like her old self again. But I don't think she ever quite got over it. Unless it was toward the end, she added. They told me she seemed much better for a little while before she died. I was away at Cambridge at the time. Poor dear lady, he said, all those years, and poor Jack Alway. He seemed to be talking to himself. Suddenly he turned to her. How is the dear fellow, he asked. Again the question troubled her. She had not seen her father since that weekend nearly six months ago, when she had ran down to see him because she wanted something from him. He felt my mother's death very deeply, she answered, but he's well enough in health. Remember me to him, he said, and tell him I thank him for all those years of love and gentleness. I don't think he will be offended. He drove her back to Paris, and she promised to come and see him in his studio and let him introduce her to his artist friends. I shall try to win you over, I warn you, he said. Politics will never reform the world. They appeal only to men's passions and hatreds. They divide us. It is art that is going to civilize mankind, broaden his sympathies. Art speaks to him the common language of his loves, his dreams, reveals to him the universal kinship. Mrs. Denton's friends called upon her, and most of them invited her to their houses. A few were politicians, senators, or ministers. Others were bankers, head of business houses, literary men and women. There were also a few quiet folk with names that were historical. They all thought that war between France and England would be a world disaster, but were not very hopeful of averting it. She learned that Carlton was in Berlin, trying to secure possession of a well-known German daily that happened at the moment to be in low water. He was working for an alliance between Germany and England. In France, the royalists had come to an understanding with the clericals, and both were evidently making ready to throw in their lot with the warmongers, hoping that out of the troubled waters, the fish would come their way. Of course, everything depended on the people, if the people only knew it, but they didn't. They stood about in puzzled flocks like sheep, wondering which way the newspaper dog was going to hound them. They took her to the great music halls. Every allusion to war was greeted with rapturous applause. The Marseillaise was demanded and encored till the orchestra rebelled from sheer exhaustion. Joan's patience was sorely tested, she had to listen with impassive face to coarse jests and brutal jibes directed against England and everything English, to sit unmoved while the vast audience rocked with laughter at senseless caricatures of supposed English soldiers whose knees always gave way at the sight of a French uniform. Even in the eyes of her courteous hosts, Joan's quick glance would occasionally detect a curious glint. The fools! Had they never heard of Waterloo and Trafalgar? Even if their memories might be excused for forgetting Creasy and Portiers and the campaigns of Marlborough. One evening, it had been a particularly trying one for Joan. They stepped upon the stage a wooden-looking man in a kilt with bagpipes under his arm. How he had got himself into the program, Joan could not understand. Managerial watchfulness must have gone to sleep for once. He played Scottish melodies, and the Parisians liked them, and when he had finished, they called him back. Joan and her friends occupied a box close to the stage. The wooden-looking Scot glanced up at her, and their eyes met, and as the applause died down, there rose the first slow warning strains of the pubok. Joan sat up in her chair, and her lips parted. The savage music quickened. It shrilled and squealed. The blood came surging through her veins. And suddenly, something lying hidden there leaped to life within her brain. A mad desire surged hold of her to rise and shout defiance at those three thousand pairs of hostile eyes confronting her. She clutched at the arms of her chair and so kept her seat. The peabrock ended with its wild sad notes of wailing, and slowly the mist cleared from her eyes, and the stage was empty. A strange hush had fallen on the house. She was not aware that her hostess had been watching her. 
She was sweet-faced, white-haired lady. She touched Joan lightly on the hand. That's the trouble, she whispered. It's in our blood. Could we ever hope to eradicate it? Was not the survival of this fighting instinct proof that war was still needful to us? In the sculpture room of an exhibition, she came upon a painted statue at Bologna. Its grotesqueness shocked her at first sight. The red streaming hair, the wild eyes filled with fury, the wide open mouth, one could almost hear it screaming. The white uplifted arms with outstretched hands, appalling, terrible, and yet, as she gazed at it, gradually the thing grew curiously real to her. She seemed to hear the gathering of the chariots, the neighing of the horses, the hurrying of many feet, the sound of an armoring multitude, the shouting and the braying of the trumpets. These cold, thin-lipped calculators arguing that war doesn't pay, those lank-haired cosmopolitans preaching their international as if the only business of mankind were wages. War was still the stern school where men learned virtue, duty, forgetfulness of self, faithfulness unto death. This particular war, of course, must be stopped if it were not already too late. It would be a war for markets, for spheres of commercial influence, a sordid war that would degrade the people. War, the supreme test of a nation's worth, must be reserved for great ideals. Besides, she wanted to down Carlton. One of the women on her list, and the one to whom Mrs. Denton appeared to attach chief importance, a Madame de Barant, disappointed Joan. She seemed to have so few opinions of her own. She had buried her young husband during the Franco-Prussian War. He had been a soldier, and she had remained unmarried. She was still beautiful. I do not think we women had the right to discuss war, she confided to Joan in her gentle, high-bred voice. I suppose you think that out of date. I should have thought so myself forty years ago. We talk of giving our sons and lovers as if they were ours to give. It makes me a little angry when I hear pampered women speak like that. It is the men who have to suffer and die. It is for them to decide. But perhaps I can arrange a meeting for you with a friend, she added, who will be better able to help you if he is in Paris. I will let you know. She told Joan what she remembered herself about 1870. She had turned her country house into a hospital and had seen a good deal of the fighting. It would not do to tell the truth, or we should have our children growing up to hate war, she concluded. She was as good as her word and sent Joan round a message the next morning to come and see her in the afternoon. Joan was introduced to a Monsieur de Chaumont. He was a soldierly-looking gentleman, with a gray mustache and a deep scar across his face. Hanged if I can see how we are going to get out of it, he answered Joan cheerfully. The moment there is any threat of war, it becomes a point of honor with every nation to do nothing to avoid it. I remember my old dueling days. The quarrel may have been about the silliest trifle imaginable. A single word would have explained the whole thing away. But to utter it, would have stamped one as a coward, the Egyptian tra-la-la. It isn't worth the bones of a single grenadier, as our friends across the Rhine would say. But I expect, before it's settled, there will be men's bones sufficient, bleaching on the desert, to build another pyramid. It's so easily started, that's the devil of it. A mischievous boy can throw a lighted match into a powder magazine and then it becomes every patriot's business to see that it isn't put out. I hate war. It accomplishes nothing, and leaves everything in a greater metal than it was before. But if the idea ever catches fire, I shall have to do all I can to fan the conflagration, unless I am prepared to be branded as a poltroon. Every professional soldier is supposed to welcome war. Most of us do. It's our opportunity. There's some excuse for us, but these men, Carlton and their lot, I regard them as nothing better than the menades of the commune. They care nothing if the whole of Europe blazes. They cannot personally get harmed whatever happens. It's fun to them. 
But the people who get harmed, argued Joan, the men who will be dragged away from their work, from their business, used as cannon fodder. He shrugged his shoulders. Oh, they are always eager enough for it, at first, he answered. There is the excitement, the curiosity. You must remember that life is a monotonous affair to the great mass of the people. There is a natural craving to escape from it, to court adventure. They are not so enthusiastic about it after they have tasted it. Modern warfare, they soon find, is about as dull a business as science ever invented. There was only one hope that he could see, and that was to switch the people's mind onto some other excitement. His advices from London told him that a parliamentary crisis was pending. Could not Mrs. Denton and her party do something to hasten it? He, on his side, would consult with the socialist leaders, who might have something to suggest. He met Joan, radiant, a morning or two later. The English government had resigned and preparations for a general election were already on foot. And God has been good to us also, he explained. A well-known artist had been found murdered in his bed and grave suspicion attached to his beautiful young wife. She deserved the croix de guerre, if it is proved that she did it, he thought. She will have saved many thousands of lives for the present. Folk had fixed a party at his studio to meet her. She had been there once or twice, but this was a final affair. She had finished her business in Paris and would be leaving the next morning. To her surprise, she found Phillips there. He had come over hurriedly to attend a socialist conference, and LeBlanc, the editor of Le Nouveau Monde, had brought him along. I took Smedley's place at the last moment, he whispered to her. I've never been abroad before. You don't mind, do you? It didn't strike her at all odd that a leader of a political party should ask her, if she minded, his being in Paris to attend a political conference. He was wearing a light gray suit and a blue tie. There was nothing about him at that moment, suggesting that he was a leader of any sort. He might have just been any man, but for his eyes. No, she whispered, of course not. I don't like your tie. It seemed to depress him, that. She felt elated at the thought that he would see her for the first time amid surroundings where she would shine. Folk came forward to meet her with that charming air of protective deference that he had adopted towards her. He might have been some favored minister of state kissing the hand of a youthful queen. She glanced down the long studio, ending in its fine window overlooking the park. Some of the most distinguished men in Paris were there, and the immediate stir of admiration that her entrance had created was unmistakable. Even the women turned pleased glances at her, as if willing to recognize in her their representative. A sense of power came to her that made her feel kind to all the world. There was no need for her to be clever, to make any effort to attract. Her presence, her sympathy, her approval seemed to be all that was needed of her. She had the consciousness that by the mere exercise of her will, she could sway the thoughts and actions of these men. That sovereignty had been given to her. It reflected itself in her slightly heightened color, in the increased brilliance of her eyes, in the confident case of all her movements. It added a compelling softness to her voice. She never quite remembered what the talk was about, Men were brought up and presented to her, and hung about her words and sought to please her. She had spoken her own thoughts, indifferent whether they expressed agreement or not, and the argument had invariably taken another plane. It seemed so important that she should be convinced. Some had succeeded and had been strengthened. Others had failed and had departed sorrowful, conscious of the necessity of thinking it out again. Guests with other engagements were taking their leave. A piquant little woman, outrageously but effectively dressed. She looked like a drawing by Beardsley, drew her aside. I've always wished I were a man, she said. It seemed to me that they had all the power. From this afternoon, I shall be proud of belonging to the governing sex. She laughed and slipped away. Phillips was waiting for her in the vestibule. She had forgotten him but now she felt glad of his humble request to be allowed to see her home. 
It would have been such a big drop from her crowded hour of triumph to the long, lonely cab ride and the solitude of the hotel. She resolved to be gracious, feeling a little sorry for her neglect of him, but reflecting with satisfaction that he had probably been watching her the whole time. What's the matter with my tie, he asked. Wrong color? She laughed. Yes, she answered. It ought to be gray to match your suit, and so ought your socks. I didn't know it was going to be such a swell affair, or I shouldn't have come, he said. She touched his hand lightly. I want you to get used to it, she said. It's part of your work. Put your brain into it, and don't be afraid. I'll try, he said. He was sitting on the front seat facing her. I'm glad I went, he said with sudden vehemence. I loved watching you, moving about among all those people. I never knew before how beautiful you are. Something in his eyes sent a slight thrill of fear through her. It was not an unpleasant sensation, rather exhilarating. She watched the passing street till she felt that his eyes were no longer devouring her. You're not offended, he asked. Am I thinking you beautiful? He added in case she hadn't understood. She laughed. Her confidence had returned to her. It doesn't generally offend a woman, she answered. He seemed relieved. That's what's so wonderful about you, he said. I've met plenty of clever, brilliant women, but one could forget that they were women. You're everything. He pleaded, standing below her on the steps of the hotel, that she would dine with him. But she shook her head. She had her packing to do. She could have managed it, but something prudent and absurd had suddenly got hold of her, and he went away with much the same look in his eyes that comes to a dog when he finds that his master cannot be persuaded into an excursion. She went up to her room. There really was not much to do. She could quite well finish her packing in the morning. She sat down at the desk and set to work to arrange her papers. It was a warm spring evening, and the window was open. A crowd of noisy sparrows seemed to be delighted about something. From somewhere, unseen, a blackbird was singing. She read over her report for Mrs. Denton. The blackbird seemed never to have heard of war. He sang as if the whole world were a garden of languor and love. Joan looked at her watch. The first gong would sound in a few minutes. She pictured the dreary, silent dining room, with his few scattered occupants, and her heart sank at the prospect. To her relief came remembrance of a cheerful but entirely respectable restaurant near to the Louvre to which he had been taken a few nights before. She had noticed quite a number of women dining there alone. She closed her dispatch case with a snap and gave a glance at herself in the great mirror. The blackbird was still singing. She walked up the Rue des Saint-Pierre, enjoying the delicious air. Halfway across the bridge, she overtook a man, strolling listlessly in front of her. There was something familiar about him. He was wearing a gray suit and had his hands in his pockets. Suddenly, the truth flashed upon her. She stopped. If he strolled on, she would be able to slip back, instead of which he abruptly turned to look down at a passing steamer, and they were face to face. It made her mad the look of delight that came into his eyes. She could have boxed his ears. Hadn't he anything else to do but hang about the streets? He explained that he had been listening to the band in the gardens, returning by the quai d'Orsay. Do let me come with you, he said. I kept myself free this evening, hoping, and I'm feeling so lonesome. Poor fellow. She had come to understand that feeling. After all, it wasn't altogether his fault that they had met, and she had been so cross to him. He was reading every expression on her face. It's such a lovely evening, he said. Couldn't we go somewhere and dine under a tree? It would be rather pleasant. There was a little place at Mudon, she remembered. The plain trees would just be in full leaf. A passing cab had drawn up close to them. The chauffeur was lighting his pipe. Even Mrs. Grundy herself couldn't object to a journalist dining with a politician. The stars came out before they had ended dinner. She had made him talk about himself. It was marvelous what he had accomplished with his opportunities. Ten hours a day in the mines had earned him his living, and the night had given him his leisure. An attic, 
lighted by a tallow candle, with a shelf of books that left him hardly enough for bread, had been his alma mater. History was his chief study. There was hardly an authority Joan could think of with which he was not familiar. Julius Caesar was his favorite play. He seemed to know it by heart. At 23, he had been elected a delegate and had entered Parliament at 28. It had been a life of hardship, of privation, of constant strain. But she found herself unable to pity him. It was a tale of strength, of struggle, of victory that he told her. Strength. The shaded lamplight fell upon his fearless, kindly face with his flashing eyes and its humorous mouth. He ought to have been drinking out of a horn, not a wine glass, that his well-shaped hand could have crushed by a careless pressure. In a winged helmet and a coat of mail, he would have looked so much more fitly dressed than in that soft felt hat and ridiculous blue tie. She led him to talk on about the future. She loved to hear his clear, confident voice with its touch of boyish boastfulness. What was there to stop him? Why shouldn't he climb from power to power till he had reached the end? And as they talked and dreamed, there grew up in her heart a fierce anger. What would her own future be? She would marry probably some man of her own class, settle down to the average woman's life, be allowed, like a spoiled child, to still take an interest in public affairs, hold drawing rooms attended by cranks and political non-entities, be president, perhaps, of the local woman's liberal league. The alternative, to spend her days glued to a desk, penning exhortations to the people that Carlton and his like might or might not allow them to read, while youth and beauty slipped away from her, leaving her one of the 10,000 other lonely, faded women, forcing themselves unwelcome into men's jobs. There came to her a sense of having been robbed of what was hers by primitive eternal law. Grayson had been right. She did love power, power to serve and shape the world. She would have earned it and used it well. She could have helped him, inspired him. They would have worked together, he the force and she the guidance. She would have supplied the things he lacked. It was to her he came for counsel, as it was. But for her, he would never have taken the first step. What right had this poor brainless lump of painted flesh to share his wounds, his triumphs? What help could she give him when the time should come that he should need it? Suddenly he broke off. What a fool I am making of myself, he said. I always was a dreamer. She forced a laugh. Why shouldn't it come true, she asked. They had the little garden to themselves. The million lights of Paris shone below them. Because you won't be there, he answered, and without you I can't do it. You think I'm always like I am tonight, bragging, confident? So I am when you are with me. You give me back my strength. The plans and hopes and dreams that were slipping from me come crowding round me, laughing and holding out their hands. They are like the children. They need two to care for them. I want to talk about them to someone who understands them and loves them as I do. I want to feel they are dear to someone else, as well as to myself, that I must work for them for her sake, as well as for my own. I want someone to help me to bring them up. There were tears in his eyes. He brushed them angrily away. Oh, I know. I ought to be ashamed of myself, he said. It wasn't her fault. She wasn't to know that a hot-blooded young chap of twenty hasn't all his wits about him any more than I was. If I had never met you, it wouldn't have mattered. I'd have done my bit of good and have stopped there, content. With you beside me, he looked away from her to where the silent city peeped through its veil of night. I might have left the world better than I found it. The blood had mounted to her face. She drew back into the shadow, beyond the tiny sphere of light, made by the little lamp. Men have accomplished great things without a woman's help, she said. Some men, he answered, artists and poets, they have the woman within them. Men like myself, the mere fighter, we are incomplete in ourselves. Male and female created he, them. 
We are lost without our mate. He was thinking only of himself. Had he no pity for her, so was she also useless without her mate. Neither was she of those here and there who can stand alone. Her task was that of the eternal woman, to make a home, to cleanse the world of sin and sorrow, and get a kinder dwelling place for the children that should come. This man was her true helpmate. He would have been her weapon, her dear servant, and she could have rewarded him as none other ever could. The lamplight fell upon his ruddy face, his strong white hands resting on the flimsy table. He belonged to an older order than her own. That suggestion about him of something primitive, of something not yet altogether tamed. She felt again that shrill thrill of fear that so strangely excited her. A mist seemed to be obscuring all things. He seemed to be coming towards her, only by keeping her eyes fixed on his moveless hands, still resting on the table. Could she convince herself that his arms were not closing about her, that she was not being drawn nearer and nearer to him, powerless to resist? Suddenly, out of the mist, she heard voices. The waiter was standing beside him with the bill. She reached out her hand and took it. The usual few mistakes had occurred. She explained them, good-temperedly, and the waiter, with profuse apologies, went back to have it corrected. He turned to her as the man went. Try and forgive me, he said in a low voice. It all came tumbling out before I thought what I was saying. The blood was flowing back into her veins. Oh, it wasn't your fault, she answered. We must make the best we can of it. He bent forward so they could see into her eyes. Tell me, he said. There was a note of fierce exultation in his voice. I'll promise never to speak of it again. If I had been a free man, could I have won you? She had risen while he was speaking. She moved to him and laid her hands upon his shoulders. Will you serve me and fight for me against all my enemies, she asked. So long as I live, he answered. She glanced round. There was no sign of the returning waiter. She bent over and kissed him. Don't come with me, she said. There's a cab stand in the avenue. I shall walk to Severus and take the train. She did not look back. End of chapter 11